Hello everyone, it is Dr. Locklear here and we are going to be talking about the concept of elimination as it relates to urinary calculi or kidney stones. This is exemplar 5D and it's on page 359 in your Pearson 4th edition text. So let's get started. We're going to look at the pathophysiology, so what happens. We're going to talk about the definition of urinary calculi or kidney stones as it's usually referred to. And how do these occur? We're going to look at the causes, the risk factors, how can we prevent it? What do we see when we assess? And your chapter has a very detailed uh, presentation of how to uh, perform a kidney assessment. And it starts with the general survey, and this is on page 365. I will not be reading through this uh, because it is very lengthy, but I do want you to read through um, and refresh your memory on how to assess the kidneys. Um, on page 366, it talks about how to position the patient, inspect, and how to palpate. And it gives you some pictures there as well. Then on page 367, it demonstrates how to do percussion. And then on 368, it talks about how to assess the left kidney, and it gives you some good pictures here and how to assess the right kidney as well. So I do want you to read over uh, and refresh your memory on uh, how to um, palpate uh, the kidney area. We're going to look at diagnostic tests, and we're going to use the nursing process. Here is a video that we will show in class, but you can watch it on your own as well. So what is our overview? Urinary calculi, often referred to as kidney stones, are caused by the development of one or more crystals ranging in size from very small to large enough to fill the renal calcices. These calculi can lodge anywhere in the urinary tract and may cause obstruction and kidney damage. The excruciating pain associated with renal calculi occurs when the multifaceted crystal scrapes against the lining of the ureter, which that's the tube that comes from the, the kidney itself. And so you got the kidney stone, uh, it's, it's sharp edges, and so it's uh, scraping against that um, ureter, and it causes extreme irritation and pain. As a result, pain management is an important consideration in caring for patients with this disorder. Urinary calculi are one of the most common causes of upper urinary tract obstruction. The term lithiasis means stone formation. When the stones form in the kidney, this is nephrolithiasis, when they form elsewhere in the urinary tract, such as the bladder, the condition is called urolithiasis. Stones may form and obstruct the urinary tract at any point. In the United States and other industrialized countries, formation of kidney, or renal or kidney calculi is common and affects approximately 1 in 11 individuals. And that's a lot of people. A lot of people deal with stones. And you see here... Uh, the different types of stones in this picture. And on page 360, there are the different types of stones, calcium phosphate or oxalate as the most common, then the struvite, then the uric acid, and the uh, cysteine. And that one's uncommon. I do want you to know those, okay? You need to know the difference in those. So what is our patho? A balance normally exists in the kidneys, between the need to conserve water and the need to eliminate poorly soluble materials such as calcium salts. This balance is affected by factors such as diet, environmental temperature, and activity. Protective inorganic and organic substances in the urine, such as pyrophosphate, citrate, and glycoproteins, normally inhibit stone or calculi formation. Three factors contribute to urolithiasis, supersaturation, uh, nucleation, formation of a crystal from a liquid, and lack of inhibitory substances in the urine. When the concentration of an insoluble salt in the urine is very high, when the urine is supersaturated, crystals may form. These crystals usually disperse and are eliminated because the bonds holding them together are weak. However, a nucleus of crystals may develop stable bonds to form a stone. 
More often, crystals form around an organic matrix or mucoprotein nucleus to become a stone. The stimulus required to initiate, initiate crystallization is supersaturated urine may be minimal. Conditions as simple as ingesting a meal high in insoluble salt or decreased fluid intake as occurs during sleep allow the concentration to increase to the point where precipitation occurs and stones form and grow. When fluid intake is adequate, no stone growth occurs. The acidity or alkalinity of the urine and the presence or absence of calculus inhibiting compounds also affect uh, uh, the lithiasis. Most kidney calculi, 75 to 80%, are composed of calcium oxalate and or calcium phosphate. These calculi are generally associated with high concentrations of calcium in the blood or urine. Uric acid stones develop when the urine concentration of uric acid is high. They are more common in men and may be associated with gout. Genetic factors contribute to the development of calculi composed of uric acid and calcium. Struvite calculi are associated with UTI caused by, un caused by urease producing bacteria such as Proteus. These stones can become very large, filling the renal pelvis and calcices. They are often called staghorn calculi because of their shape, and you do need to remember that term, staghorn calculi. Cysteine stones, which are rare, are associated with a genetic defect. The types of renal calculi Contributing factors and recommended dietary modifications are in Table 5.6. And so let's look at Table 5.6. So you got the calcium phosphate is the most common. Uh, your management, uh, thiazide diuretics, potassium citrate, limit foods high in sodium and animal protein, maintain calcium intake, increase foods that acidify urine protein, increase hydration and exercise. Uh, your struvite, because of the UTI, you're going to be looking at antibiotics. Uric acid, you're going to be looking at drugs such as uh, allopurinol um, or another drug called kosheshine. Uh, but uh, allopurinol is um, uh, one of the drugs of choice for, for gout. And then the cysteine, uh, this is sodium restriction um, and pharmacological is... Um, uh, potassium citrate and penicillamine. So make sure you look at this chart, okay? And there's your types of kidney stones and how they look. So you can see the difference in, in how the, the stones can form and look. And look how big they are. These are actual pictures of kidney stones. What is the etiology? Most urinary calculi form in the renal pelvis and are composed primarily of calcium salts. There has been an upward trend in the prevalence of kidney stones in developed countries. In the United States, approximately 5% of adults experienced renal calculi uh, in 1994, increasing to 9% in 2010. Approximately half of all individuals who experience a kidney stone are likely to have a recurrence within 10 years. In the United States, the incidence varies by region with the highest frequency in the South. Males are at greater risk for kidney stones than females Calculi or more common, or uh, uh, calculi or more common non-Hispanic white populations and those of lower socioeconomic status. So, what are our risk factors? Although the majority of urinary stones are idiopathic, having no uh, uh, known cause, so to speak, a number of risk factors have been identified. The greatest risk factor for stone formation is a prior personal or family history of urinary calculi. A genetic predisposition to the accumulation of certain mineral substances in the urine or a congenital lack of protective factors may explain the familial link. Other identified risk factors include dehydration with resultant increased urine concentration, obesity and excess dietary intake of calcium, oscillate or proteins. Gout, hyperparathyroidism and urinary stasis or repeated infections also contribute to calculus formation. Loss of calcium from the bones due to immobility and dehydration are major risk factors for urinary stones. 
So people who are compromised with mobility may have a higher incidence of, of um, developing the kidney stones. Living in a hot climate, so down in the south, has also been identified as a risk factor. Certain medications are associated with stone formation, including probenicid, several protease inhibitors, lipase inhibitors, triamaterine, chemotherapy, vitamin C, vitamin D, calcium, and some carbonic anhydrase inhibitors. Sex also plays a role in kidney stone formation with the risk of calculus formation as high as 16% in males and 8% in females. So what is our prevention? Adequate fluid intake is the most important intervention for preventing all types of kidney stones. In addition, specific measures can be taken to prevent each type of kidney stone. Calcium stones can be prevented by reducing sodium and animal protein, so a low-fat diet, getting enough calcium from food, and avoiding foods high in oxalate, such as spinach, nuts, wheat, and bran. Uric acid stones can be prevented by limiting animal protein intake. For individuals with a history of kidney stones, medications may help prevent future stone formation. These include thiazide diuretics are used to prevent calcium stones, allopurinol is used to prevent uric acid stones, and antibiotics may help prevent the struvite stones. And then you have a teaching box. It says, since urinary calculi have a high rate of occurrence, teach patients the following measures. Drink 2.5 to 3 liters of fluids each day unless you're contraindicated to dilute the urine and flush out substances that can cause calculi. Those with cysteine calculi may be directed to drink even more. Drinking water is best, but citrus juice containing citrates such as lemonade may prevent calculi formation. Increase fluid intake if working or exercising in a hot environment to replace fluids lost through sweating. Take prescribed medication based on the specific makeup of the calculus to prevent further stone formation. Follow the prescribed diet based on the composition of the calculus. And Table 5-6 gives you some specific diets like the uric acid, a low protein, uh, low purine diet. Um, and then uh, the, the cysteine uh, uh, sodium restriction. Um, uh, calcium phosphate, urine, limit foods high in sodium and animal protein, maintain calcium intake, but increase foods that acidify urine protein. So you may want to look at that. Follow instructions for 24-hour urine collection if prescribed to determine pH, urine calcium, uric acid, and oscillate levels, and if daily urine production is sufficient to prevent stone formation. Recommendations for more specific fluid and diet intake can be made based on the urine output in 24 hours. So you may have to teach them how to collect urine through the 24 hour urine collection. And here's a little chart uh, about kidney stone prevention as it relates to uh, diet and water and medications. That was a good little chart. Clinical manifestations. The symptoms caused by urinary calculi vary with their size and location. Manifestations develop from obstructed urine flow resulting in distension and from tissue trauma caused by passage of the rough edge crystalline or crystalline stone. Calculi affecting the stone calcices and pelvis may cause few symptoms. If the stone has gradually or partially obstructed urinary flow, dull aching flank pain may be present. But renal calculi are often without symptoms. Bladder calculi may cause few symptoms other than dull suprapubic pain with exercise or after voiding. Renal calculi, acute severe flank pain on the affected side, develops when a stone obstructs the ureter causing uh, ureteral spasms, stretching and dilation. It's very painful. The pain of renal colic may radiate to the suprapubic region, groin and external genitals, the scrotium or labia. The severity of the pain often causes a sympathetic response with associated nausea and vomiting, pallor, cool, clammy skin, and they will have nausea and vomiting with a kidney stone. Manifestations of UTI include chills, fever, frequency, urgency, and dysuria, which is pain with urination, may accompany urinary calculi at any level. Calculi may cause trauma to the urinary tract, resulting in gross or microscopic hematuria, blood in the urine. 
gross hematuria is often the only sign of bladder stones. So uh, you've got a lot of symptoms to look for uh, here. Some complications, urinary stones may obstruct urine flow at any point in the urinary tract causing complications such as hydronephrosis in large kidney and urinary stasis with subsequent ur urinary tract infection. Obstruction, stones can obstruct the urinary tract from the calcices of the kidney to the distal urethra, impending the outflow of urine. If the obstruction develops slowly, there may be few or no symptoms, whereas sudden obstruction, blockage of a ureter by a passing stone, may cause severe manifestations, and it is severe. Urinary tract obstruction can ultimately lead to renal failure. The degree of obstruction, its location, and the duration of impaired urine flow determine the effect on renal function. And that can, it can get really large and, and shut down, and then you've got a whole other set of problems. Hydronephrosis. The kidneys continue to produce urine, causing increased pressure and distension of the urinary tract behind the obstruction. I mean, the kidneys are still working, even though you've got an obstruction. So you can see the difference in the size of the kidneys on the last slide and this one. Hydronephrosis is an accumulation of urine in the renal pelvis as a result of obstructive flow. So it's, it's backed up in the kidney. And hydrouretor, distension of the ureter with urine, can also occur. If the pressure is not relieved, damage to the collecting tubules, proximal tubules, and glomeruli of the kidney cause a gradual loss of renal function. Acute hydronephrosis typically causes colicky pain on the affected side. The pain may radiate into the groin. Chronic hydronephrosis develops slowly and may have few manifestations other than dull, aching back, or flank pain. When hydronephrosis is significant, a palpable mass may be felt in the flank region. Hematuria and signs of UTI such as pyuria, fever, and discomfort may occur. Gastrointestinal symptoms such as nausea and vomiting and abdominal pain may accompany hydronephrosis. And so, uh, again, this urine is backed up because it's blocked and your kidney's going to get full and it's going to shut down and it's very painful. It's got to be treated. It's in a medical emergency. The urinary stasis associated uh, with partial or complete obstruction increases the risk of upper and lower UTI. So, again, when that urine is, is stasis because there's bacteria in the urine, we got to get it out. It's very damaging because our kidneys have got to, they got to work, they got to move, they got to get the fluid out. Before we move to this slide, look on page 361 and it gives you your clinical manifestations. So acute hydronephrosis, so you have that colicky pain and then the clinical therapies, um, IV therapy, lithotripsy, dietary modification, uh, BUN, creatinine, um, you know, they're, and they're gonna try to, to get that urine out. Chronic hydronephrosis, kidney stones, ureteral stones, and bladder stones. And it gives you what you would see for like chronic hydronephrosis, signs and symptoms of UTI, and it may occur, and it may be a chronic UTI. And it may have UTI every time they turn around. Collaborative care. Collaborative care for patients diagnosed with urinary calculi focuses on relieving acute symptoms destroying or removing stones, and preventing further stone formation. Asymptomatic stones, those not causing pain, infection, or obstruction, are treated conservatively on an outpatient basis. More urgent treatment may be needed depending on the location of the calculi, the degree of obstruction, level of pain, bleeding, kidney function, and presence of the UTI. And so here are some of the diagnostic tests, uh, urinalysis, they're looking for crystal fragments, WBCs, the urine pH. A urine pH less than 5.5 suggests a uric acid calculus. They're looking for nitrates. Again, WBCs and bacteria may indicate a UTI. 24-hour urine collection. With the patient on a random diet uh, may be performed after a stone has been passed to determine urine volume, pH, and levels of calcium, oxalate, uric acid, citrate, sodium, and potassium to aid in identification of possible lithiasis. Elevated calcium levels occur in hyperparathyroidism, Cushing syndrome, and osteoporosis, all of which may contribute to, to lithiasis. Uric acid levels may be elevated in patients with gout, 
and those at risk for forming uric acid calculi. Urine oxalate excretion helps to differentiate calcium oxalate from calcium phosphate stones. And so the 24-hour urine is something that you, you will help um, collect. Uh, chemical analysis, uh, the electrolyte and renal function test. Um, it says the patient who has been vomiting may have electrolyte abnormalities. They look at serum calcium phosphorin as uric acid levels, the parathyroid hormone because um, of hyperparathyroidism. They look at uh, the size uh, of your kidneys and ureters and bladder. They do an ultrasound to check for hydronephrosis. A CT uh, identifies size and location of the calculi and where the obstruction is. And then cystoscopy and where they can actually go in with a cystoscope and remove stones in that urinary tract or in the bladder. Um, <clears throat> but you may have to have lithotripsy to get it out of the um, urine. <clears throat> Excuse me. Non-pharmacologic therapy, small ureteral stones equal to or less than 10 millimeters may be treated conservatively as an outpatient with the patient straining their urine to detect passage of the calculus and ana analysis performed to determine its composition. Increased fluid intake reduces the risk of further stone formation and promotes urine output. But recent research does not support the theory that fluids promote the passage of stones. If the patient is dehydrated and cannot consume fluids orally, IV fluids will be needed. Kidney stone recurrence is common following the first episode of a symptomatic kidney stone with the highest rate of recurrence occurring during the first year. Dietary changes are also recommended to reduce um, recurrence of urinary calculi based on the composition. And again, it refers you to table um, 5.6 and the teaching box. So what do we use for pharmacology? An acute episode of renal colic is treated with analgesia and hydration. Previously, opioid analgesics were the first line drugs to use to manage renal pain, but with current concerns about opioid use, non-opioid analgesics such as NSAIDs are used. If an oral NSAID cannot be administered due to nausea and vomiting, the IV NSAID Keterolac may be administered. A narcotic analgesic such as morphine sulfate may be given, often IV to relieve pain and reduce uh, ureteral spasm, not relieved by an NSAID. Endomethacin, an NSAID given as a suppository, may reduce the amount of narcotic analgesia required for acute renal colic. If the patient has nausea and vomiting, an antiemetic may be given, uh, such as Zofran. Antibiotics are prescribed for the patient who has a UTI. Passage of a small ureteral stone, 5 to 10 millimeters in diameter, may be aided by an alpha adrenergic blocker through relaxation of the smooth muscles of the uh, ure ureters. And these are some of the medicines that we talked about with BPH in uh, 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 exemplar 5A. So you may want to go back and look at those medicines because there's a chart there with the adrenergic blockers on it. After analysis of the calculus, various medications may be ordered to inhibit or prevent further lithiasis. A thiazide diuretic, and the thiazides are listed in uh, exemplar um, chart 5.1, and this should be in your concept. Um, and I'm looking to see... This should be in your concept of elimination, the actual concept. So let's go back and, and look. And it says um, medications 5.1. And I'm looking to see. And yes, here it is on page 304. 304. Those are the medicines that they're referring to. Um, a thiazide diuretic frequently prescribed for calcium calculi reduces urinary calcium excretion and is effective in preventing stones. Potassium citrate alkalazines, um, potassium citrate alkalinazines urine raises the pH and is often prescribed to prevent stones that tend to form in acidic urine, uric acid, cysteine, and some forms of calcium stones. Allopurinol can reduce the risk of recurrent calcium oscillate stones 
when hyper euro -suria, don't you love these words, and normal urine calcium levels are present. Again, look at table 5.6 uh, to refer to allopurinol. Okay, some of these names, I don't know. Okay, surgery. What kind of surgery are we looking at? One of the most common is uh, lithotripsy. Surgical intervention for removal of calculi is usually indicated if there's severe obstruction, recurring infection, intractable pain, or heavy bleeding. The decision to perform surgery also depends on the location and accessibility of the stone and the patient's general state of health. Additionally, surgery may be considered for the patient who does not pass a stone after four to six weeks of outpatient treatment. Lithotripsy uses sound or shock waves to crush a stone is the preferred treatment. There are several lithotripsy techniques. Extracorporeal shock wave lithotripsy is a non-invasive technique for fragmenting kidney stones by using shock waves generated outside the body. Acoustic shock waves are aimed at the stone under fluoroscopic guidance. These shock waves travel through soft tissue without causing damage and shatter the stone as its greater density stops their progress. Repeated shock waves pulverize the stone into fragments that are small enough to pass through the urinary tract in the flow of urine. Lithotripsy can be performed during an office visit or as an outpatient procedure. Lithotripsy may also be performed with a percutaneous ultrasonic or laser technique. Percutaneous ultrasonic lithotripsy uses a nephroscope inserted into the kidney pelvis through a small flank incision. A small ultrasonic transducer fragments the stone and the fragments are removed through the nephro uh, nephroscope and they kind of suction them out is, is what they do. And here's some pictures here on page 367 of some of the types of surgeries that they do. Laser lithotripsy is an alternative to ultrasonic lithotripsy. Laser beams are used to disintegrate the stone without damaging soft tissue. A nephroscope or a ureteroscope passed up the ureter from the bladder during cystoscopy is used to guide the laser probe into direct contact with the stone. A double J stent may be inserted into the affected ureter to maintain its patency uh, following the, um, uh, the shockwave uh, treatment. On rare occasions, surgical intervention is necessary to remove a calculus in the renal pelvis. Ureterolithotomy is an incision made in the effective urinal to remove the stone. In other words, they can go in there and get it out and cut it out. Pyelolithotomy is an incision into the kidney pelvis and removal of a stone. A staghorn calculus that invades the calcices and renal parenchyma may require nephrolithotomy for removal. Bladder stones may be removed by an instrument passed through a cystoscope to crush the stones. The remaining stone fragments are then irrigated out of the bladder with an acid solution that counteracts the alkalinity that precipitated stone formation. So a lot of things can be done. Um, now let's look at the lifespan. Although rare in newborns and infants is considered rare, risk factors for kidney stone in infants, low birth weight, use of furosemide, and metabolic disorders. The clinical manifestations for infants are not specific, but most commonly vomiting and restlessness. Little is known about stone resolution and the need for medical and surgical intervention in this age group. So you don't see it a whole lot. Uh, children, children can have kidney stones. Um, the incidence of kidney stones in children is increasing, although it is difficult to know if it is worldwide because there's a lack of centralized database. In children and adolescents, clinical manifestations of ureolithiasis include dysuria, hematuria, and sharp pain in the back, lower abdomen, or groin. Pain may be short or long in duration and may be accompanied by nausea and vomiting, fever, and chills, just like the adult. Some children may pass the stone with no symptoms, while others require intervention, such as shockwave lithotripsy, cystoscopy, and ureteroscopy or percutaneous nephrolithotomy. Kidney stones are more likely to develop in children with defects of the urinary tract uh, area and metabolic disorders such as hypercalciuria. Other risk factors include a family history of kidney stones, dietary factors, and disorders such as cystic fibrosis, uh, obesity, and repeated UTIs. 
The recommended follow-up care for children previously treated for urolithiasis is diligent screening for risk factors, 24-hour urine collection to evaluate the presence of hypercalcuria, hyperurosuria, hypomagnesusuria, hyperoxalusuria, and hypocitrosuria to prevent renal insufficiency. Man, that was a mouthful, wasn't it? All these big old words. Uh, so it does happen in children. I think a lot of it has to do with their diet, too, because we have childhood obesity, but that's just my opinion. Uh, pregnancy. Pregnant women also require special consideration when assessing and treating urinary calculi. Symptoms of urolithiasis are common during pregnancy, and the symptoms may be misdiagnosis of appendicitis, diverticulitis, or placento, placental abruption. If kidney stones do not pass spontaneously, numerous complications occur, including premature labor, intractable pain, urosepsis, and interruption of normal progression of labor. Diagnosis and treatment of pregnant women is also complicated by the inability to use radiation, anesthesia, and surgery. Renal ultrasonography is the image modality of choice for pregnant women and conservative management, such as ureteroscopy and nephrostomy, can be used for invasive treatments. And then again, for the adult, uh, we've already talked about uh, the adult, and here are the clinical manifestations, fever, diarrhea, pyuria, and um, it says diagnosis is often delayed due to difference in presentation because, you know, older adults have more um, health disparities. So sometimes they, you know, they got to rule out this to get that. And here's a little chart on uh, kidney stone symptoms. And again, kidney stones are very, very painful. Nursing process. Nursing care for the patient with urolithiasis is directed at providing comfort during acute renal colic, assisting with diagnostic procedures, ensuring adequate urinary output, and teaching the patient information necessary to prevent future stone formation. So what do we look at for the assessment? <clears throat> the nurse should obtain the following subjective and objective data. Observation and patient interview. The nurse may observe the patient grimacing, moaning, or guarding the flank area on either side of the lower back. The patient may bend over at the waist to guard the pain. The patient may pace the floor or request to sit or lay down, occasionally in unusual positions. Some people will become pale and stoic, whereas others cry out because the pain is so intense. Once pain is controlled and the patient is able to answer questions, the nurse should obtain a dietary history intake of calcium, sodium, fluid, fruits and vegetables, proteins, high oxalate foods, and purines. Medication should be reviewed for those that may increase the risk of stone formation. And I'm telling you, these people are in pain. They're in pain. Um, and, when, and, and if you ever had a kidney stone, you know what I'm talking about. I've never had one, but I've, I've worked with patients that have. Um, a physical assessment. <clears throat> uh, before we get to physical assessment, let's talk about the pain assessment. During the assessment interview, questions should be directed toward obtaining information about flank, back, or abdominal pain and a description of radiation, characteristics, timing, and aggravating or relieving factors. Further questioning should elicit additional symptoms such as nausea and vomiting, possible contributing factors such as dehydration, previous or family history of kidney stones, and current or previous treatment measures. Note that pain caused by calculi in the kidney or upper ureter is unique and different in character, severity, and duration from that caused by kidney enlargement. Pain from a stone occurs as it travels from the kidney to the ureters and the urinary bladder. And these stones are sharp, so it's cutting the, the, the inside of the ureter, and, it, and it's like a cutting, sharp, stabbing pain as it goes down. That's why I make you see some blood in the urine. Some patients experience no pain and others have excruciating pain. A stationary stone causes a dull aching pain. As stones travel down the urinary tract, spasms occur. These spasms produce sharp, intermittent, colicky pain, often with chills, fever, and nausea and vomiting. It radiates from the flank to the lower quadrants of the abdomen, some cases the upper thigh and scrotum or labia. The nurse should note the patient's general appearance, position, vital signs, skin color, temperature, moisture, and skin turgor, abdominal flank, and costovertebral tenderness, and amount, color, and characteristics of urine pH 
and the presence of hematuria, bacteria, and pyuria. <clears throat> Assessment guidelines for percussion and palpation of the kidneys are demonstrated in this chart that I was telling you about. And make sure that you read over this chart. Um, it's several pages uh, in this chapter, and uh, it's just too much to put on this presentation, but you do need to read over it. Note that the kidney of an older patient are more difficult to palpate abdominally because the mass of the adrenal cortex decreases with age. The nurse should emit blunt percussion in a frail older individual. Instead, palpation of the costovertebral angles and flanks can be used to reveal any pain or tenderness. And, and sometimes it's tender and they, they won't let you touch them, okay? Um, in some clinical settings, the healthcare provider will perform the kidney assessment. When conducting the assessment, note that flank color and asymmetry and, and symmetry must be carefully correlated to other diagnostic cues as the assessment proceeds. If ecchymosis, which is bruising, is present, this is called gray Turner sign, there may be other signs of trauma such as blunt penetrating wounds or laceration. So this gray Turner sign is a bruising and it's usually caused from some kind of blunt uh, trauma. So read through the kidney assessment, okay? Here are your diagnoses, of course, of course, acute pain, urinary retention, anxiety, risk for infection, and could be many more. Uh, we want to control the pain, get the urine output going, no signs and symptoms of a UTI, uh, take care of the stone, treat it, you know, diet, medications, or surgical procedure, whatever's needed, and reduce their anxiety. Implementation. When treatment of urolithiasis typically occurs as an outpatient, the patient with acute pain or a large stone may require hospitalization. Complications such as UTI, obstruction, or hydronephrosis require the collaboration of the healthcare team. While treating the patient's pain may be the most immediate intervention, patient teaching and health promotion are needed to help the patient maintain urinary health beyond the current need for healthcare intervention. Patients with urolithiasis will need education about lifestyle modification to reduce the risk of stone formation. So how do we manage the pain? Pain is the primary manifestation of urolithiasis, particularly when a calculus becomes immovable in a ureter, causing acute obstruction and distension. Invasive and non-invasive procedures to remove or crush stones may also be painful. Patients undergoing surgery also experience incisional pain. To address the patient's pain, the nurse should do the following. Assess pain using the standard pain scale and include the characteristic of this pain. Administer analgesia as, provide, as pres prescribed. Monitor its, its effectiveness using the zero to 10 scale and document the pain's response to the pain medication. Explain to the patient that taking the prescribed NSAID on a routine schedule can significantly decrease the need for narcotic analgesia in patients with renal colic. Encourage ambulation, unless it's contraindicated, because ambulation might help the stone move. In the patient with renal colic, it facilitates movement of the calculus through the ureter, subsequently decreasing the pain. Use non-pharmacological measures such as positioning, moist heat, relaxation techniques, guided imagery, and diversion as adjunctive therapy for pain. Adjunctive pain relief measures can enhance the effectiveness of analgesics and other prescribed treatment. If surgery has been performed, monitor urinary output catheters, incision, and wound drainage. Pain may be a symptom of proximal distension due to a blocked catheter. Infection or hematoma at the surgical site can decrease pain significantly. Teach the patient being treated as an outpatient how to manage pain uh, caused by kidney stones and when to report it and, and when to seek medical attention. But, you know, with a kidney stone, you're going to know when to, to seek medical attention because it's so painful. Uh, urinary output. Obstruction of the urinary tract is the primary problem associated with urolithiasis. If a stone obstructs the ureter, distension of the renal pelvises and calcices can occur, causing hydronephrosis, possible kidney damage. To reduce the risk of damage, the nurse should do the following. Assess for manifestations of hydronephrosis as dull flank pain or aching and changes in renal function studies 
BUN and creatinine levels. Monitor amount and character of urine output. If the patient has an indwelling catheter, measure output hourly. Urine volume reflects possible urinary tract obstruction. Strain all urine for stones, saving any recovered stones for laboratory analysis. Analysis of calculi removed from the urine can direct measures used to prevent further uh, lithiasis. Document hematuria, dysuria, frequency, uh, urgency, and pyuria. Hematuria, gross or microscopic, is also associated with calculi and with procedures used to remove the stones, such as cystoscopy or lithotripsy. A change in the amount of hematuria may indicate stone passage or complication. Dysuria, frequency, urgency, and cloudy urine are symptoms of UTI, often associated with urolithiasis, so antibiotic therapy may be used. A stone that completely obstructs the ureter can lead to hydronephrosis and kidney damage on the affected side. Because the other kidney continues to function, urine output may not fall significantly with obstruction of one ureter. A rising BUN and serum creatinine may be early signs of renal failure. Obstruction can ultimately lead to stasis, infection, or irreversible renal damage. Maintain patency and integrity of any catheters. Keep the urine free flowing. A kink or plug catheter, particularly a, a ureteral catheter or nephrostomy tube, may damage the urinary system. Labeling catheters can prevent mistakes such as inappropriate irrigation and clamping. And look at box 5.9, and it's talking about nursing care of the patient having lithotripsy. I want you to read over this because this the recording's getting pretty lengthy. Um, but read over this. Um, Post-operative care, you want to monitor vital signs. The kidney is highly vascular. Hemorrhage, resulting shock or potential complications. Monitor for bleeding. Monitor urine amount, color, and clarity of the urine. Urine's often bright red, but bleeding should diminish within 48 to 72 hours. Cloudy urine may indicate the presence of a UTI. Maintain placement and patency of urinary catheters or any other catheters like the nephrostomy tubes that are coming directly out of the back. Make sure it's not kinked or plugged because it can cause backup and cause hydronephrosis. Decrease urinary output and flank pain are possible symptoms of obstruction. And then uh, it talks about um, the home care. Uh, make sure that you read over that as well. Okay, the chart there. Um, patient teaching. The patient with urolithiasis has multiple learning needs, including information about the disease and its possible consequences, understanding of any diagnostic or therapeutic procedures performed, and strategies to prevent future lithiasis. The nurse working with the patient should do the following. Provide teaching about all diagnostic tests and treatment procedures. Knowing what to expect reduces anxiety and enhances compliance and hastens recovery. That's true. Teach the patient being treated at home to collect and strain all urine, and you'll give them the little straining cups uh, to take home with them. Report stone passage to the physician and bring in the stone for analysis. Report any changes in the amount or character of urine output, such as reduced urine output or cloudy or bloody urine. Teach about the relationship between renal calculi and UTI, emphasizing preventive measures and the importance of prompt treatment. UTI promotes urolithiasis and thus requires prompt treatment. So uh, UTI in itself is difficult enough, but it can lead to um, uh, uh, the uh, production of kidney stones. So now you might have two things going on. Promote health and wellness. The risk of recurrent urolithiasis is approximately 50%. However, this risk can be reduced through measures used to prevent conditions favoring stone formation. So what do we do? Discuss the importance of maintaining adequate fluid intake to re reduce, keep the flow going. It can, it, it, you know, we have this stuff in our kidneys uh, just from the foods that we have and, you know, what our body makes. Um, but that if we have enough hydration, it'll, it'll flush these little stones out, hopefully. The nurse should also stress the need to increase fluid intake during warm weather and strenuous exercise or physical labor. Explain the relationship between weight-bearing activity and retention of calcium in the bones. Encourage the patient to remain physically active because you have to have, um, you, you, if you have wasting syndrome from immobility, 
um, it's going to affect the calcium production in your bones. The more you're up moving around, the, the, the stronger your bone is because it helps the production of the calcium. Um, encourage the patient to remain physically active to prevent bone resorption and possible hypercalciuria. Emphasize the importance of increasing fluid intake to 2.5 to 3 liters per day to produce a urinary output of 2 to 2.5 liters per day if not contraindicated, uh, like with heart failure and stuff like that. Teach the patient with frequent UTIs measures to reduce the incidence and risk of lithiasis. Discuss signs and symptoms that indicate UTI and need for prompt medical attention and teach them how to have good hygiene. Females should wipe front to back um, and you need daily hygiene. Um, and, and, and again, drinking a lot of fluid is going to help with that and, and good hygiene care, keeping that bacteria down, especially in females. Teach the patient about the recommended dietary modifications needed based on the makeup of the stone, table 5.6. So make sure you look at that. Uh, refer the patient to a dietitian. Teach about management of prescribed medications for reducing the recurrence of calculi, including dosing, frequency, and potential adverse effects that should be reported to the healthcare provider. Because all medications can have an effect on you. They have side effects. And then here are your expected outcomes. The pain rates at a, a three, the patient rates pain at three or less. And, you know, these are, these are really, y'all really need to use your book to help you do your, um, your weekly care plans because you have a lot of good in, interventions in them. And like, you know, this can be used when you talk about planning, that's your outcome, the patient will. And uh, so, of course, we want them to, um, you know, get back to normal daily living, no pain, less than three, and the kidney stone passes.